The Beautiful Hell by T. Kuhn, originally published 2004. This text from illwill.com. The following text appeared anonymously in Leo, France in 2004 in a collection entitled The Party's Over, La Fête et Fini, and in which no author attribution was given. Its aim was to respond to the assault known as Leo 2004, European capital of culture, an offensive aimed at nothing less than a complete conquest and reconfiguration of the city. The text gathered in the slim volume offer a record of a lucid and articulate dissent, one which may still prove useful in the event of future battles. As a matter of fact, in 2013, when the city of Marseille suffered an urban planning campaign of comparable magnitude and intentions to that of Lille, the irreducibility of Foucault named the film through which they asserted their opposition to what was intended to be done with their city, La Fête et Fini. In this way, Marseille avenged the defeat suffered in Lille. The hell of a living is not something to come. If there is one, it is what is already here. The hell in which we live every day, that we form by being together. There are two ways to escape its suffering. The first is easy for many, accept the hell and become such a part of it that you can no longer even see it. The second is risky and demands continuous attention and apprehension. Seek and learn to recognize who and what in the midst of the hell are not hell, then make them endure. Give them space from Italo Covino, Invisible Cities. For us, everything having to do with aesthetics is irreducibly hostile. We use the word hostile here as distinct from enemy. As someone once wrote, quote, the enemy is our own question, manifested as a figure, end quote. For us, there is no aesthetic question. When some hipster publishes a novel by which he vows to bring communism back into fashion, we perceive very exactly the operation he's attempting against us, and we commit the book to the flames without regrets. Here the foolish thing would be precisely to try and understand when destroying is all that's called for. If aesthetics were only the science of the beautiful, or of taste, or a certain regime of intelligibility of the arts, that point where, toward the end of the 18th century, one stops speaking of the fine arts, the liberal arts, and the mechanical arts, in order to speak of art, a special sector of existence, jealously different from ordinary life. There will be no beauty salon at the street corner, or punk attitude, or even any free zones in art galleries, and it's certain that no one would get the idea of transforming the last small farmers into custodians of the landscape. There is less aesthetics in Warburg's history of art than in one hour of the life of a publicist. In its entire framework, aesthetics is metropolitan existence, and in a real sense, it is a new imperial society. Aesthetics is the form taken by the apparent fusion in the metropolis of capital and life. Just as valorization now finds its ultima ratio in the fact that a thing or a being pleases power, which no longer manages to justify its machinations without some reference to truth and justice, likewise recovers its fullest freedom of action as soon as it advances under the mask of aesthetics. A Nietzschean for managers wrote a few years ago, quote, the aesthetic paradigm is the angle of attack allowing us to account for a constellation of actions, sentiments, and specific ambiences of a spirit of post-modernity, end quote. This statement was followed by celebrations of hipster bar sociality, of all that cybernetic conviviality and profitable superficiality, of those glacial loves that constitute the peculiar attraction of the metropolitan centers. Aesthetics is imperial neutralization, that is, where there isn't direct recourse to the police. Understand aesthetics? There is understanding only on the basis of empathy, and our empathy doesn't extend to what harms us. Should we try to understand the police? No. Know how they function, how they operate, where they are currently, what means they have at their disposal, and how to destroy them, yes, but not in order to understand them. The whole work of metaphysics, the entire project of civilization in the West, was to separate, at every opportunity, the human from the non-human, consciousness from the world, knowledge from power, work from existence, form from content, art from life, being from its determinations, contemplation from action, etc. 
We put quotation marks because none of these things exist as such before it's been separated from its contrary and thereby produced as such. Once this separation is carried out and each of these unilaterallys is produced, an institution will be assigned the task of maintaining them in their separation. The museum institution and its auxiliary art criticism, for example, guaranteed on the one hand the existence of art as art, and on the other, that of the prosaic world as prosaic world. A certain desolation ensued. Aesthetics then arose as an attempt to animate that desolation, to reunify everything the West had separated, but to reunify it externally as separated. The epoch that gave birth to aesthetics is thus basically that of the crisis of all institutions. But if the walls of the museum and the schools, the businesses and the hospitals, like the very walls of bourgeois individuality, crumble and fall, it's in order to bring every space under the control of an apparatus. That is, in order to incorporate the apparatus into every being, given the extent to which we are affected by the things we pass through. Henceforth, we will no longer distinguish between existence and work, but everyone will have a cell phone on whose directory the distinction between friends and colleagues will have been lost, so that they can be merged into any hour of the day. There will be no more lives devoted exclusively to contemplation or others to pure action, no more clerks or specialists in warfare, but reflexivity will take over every moment of existence, and no one will perform an act without making themselves at the same time a spectator of their own acts. At the limit, no one will make love without every moment being conscious of making love changing the erotic art into universal pornography. There will be no more bosses, no more slaves, but each individual will be their own boss, will have engraved in their heart the laws of self-valorization. Everyone will have become for themselves a little enterprise. Here the empire is the product of police terror. They are the product of aesthetic synthesis. The continuation and deepening of the Western disaster everywhere takes the form of its subversion. They claim everywhere to be repairing, only to commit further damage. They destroy everywhere irrevocably on the pretext of reconstructing. Aesthetics are revolution. That aesthetics was given the mission of rejoining what the West constantly strove to definitively divide is something that goes back to aesthetics' official beginnings in the Kantian system. Kant's 1788 critique of judgment confers on the beautiful and on art the task of reconciling the infinity of moral liberty and the strict causality that rules nature, of filling the incommensurable chasm that at first separates the critique of pure reason and the critique of practical reason. Less than six years later, aesthetics will be recast by Schiller as a counter-revolutionary program, as an explicit response to the communist insurrectionary tendencies of the French Revolution. This masterpiece of Western reaction is called Letter on the Aesthetic Education of Man and appears in 1794. Its reasoning is as follows. There are in man two antagonistic instincts, the sensual instinct that anchors him in particularity, in vital necessities and feelings, in short determination, and the formal rational instinct, which through reflection draws them out of particularity and the effects and lifts them up to the universal truths. These two aspects are always in conflict in such a way that what the one possesses is always taken from the other, except at a juncture of harmony where they meet and comfort one another. This point of miraculous conciliation of supreme grace is the aesthetic state, and what corresponds to it is the instinct of play. Quote, One of the most important tasks of culture, then, is to submit man to form, even in a purely physical life and to render it aesthetic as far as the domain of the beautiful can be extended. Thus, to make the sensual man rational, the only route to follow is to begin by making him into an aesthetic man. The sensual man must be first brought under another sky. In the aesthetic state, the most slavish tool is a free citizen, having the same rights as a noblest. And the intellectual, which shapes the mass to its intent, must consult it concerning its destination. Consequently, in the realm of aesthetic appearance, the idea of equality is realized, end quote. In fact, the equality spoken of here is the ideal of imperial neutralization where, with everyone simulating, feigning to do what they do, to be what they are, the worker, the boss, the minister, the artist, the male, the female, the mother, the lover, no one ever adhering to their facticity, all conflict is diffused in advance. 
I'm not really who you think, you know, whispers the metropolitan creature while deconstructing themselves in your bed. But it's actually German idealism in its entirety that draws its own operation from these letters. The phenomenology of spirit, which concludes after all with two verses by Schiller, endlessly amassed in substantial character of every determination. The falsity of sense certainty. For the problem with sensual man is that he doesn't let himself be pushed around. He resists discourse. He builds barricades and sometimes takes up arms and refuses to be reasoned with. That he has in some a strong propensity to irreducibility. And then there's the anonymous manifesto, alternatively attributed to Schelling, to Hegel, and to Halderlin, and known as the oldest systematic program of German idealism. There one reads, quote, the philosophy of the spirit is an aesthetic philosophy. One cannot be clever in anything. One cannot even reason cleverly in history without aesthetic sense. At the same time, we so often hear that the great multitude should have a sensual religion. Then general freedom and equality of spirits will reign. A higher spirit sent from heaven must establish his religion among us. It will be the last work of the human race, end quote. This new religion, this sensory religion, found its fulfillment in our epic of design, urbanism, biopolitics, and advertising. It is nothing other than capital in its imperial phase. Where aesthetics claims to reunite what it has essentially separated, the messianic gesture consists in assuming the union that is there. It's a spectacle that, for a century, has never ceased to be hilarious. The chronic paralysis of those seeking to overcome the separation between art and life, all those who, in the same gesture, create a separation and claim to abolish it. The aesthetic operation dominates our epic through this double, duplicitous movement of bringing everything together so as to place everything at a distance. In this sense, it is indeed that moment of final recapitulation and parody, that recollection of memory which Hegel speaks of in reference to absolute knowledge, where everything is archived. It's not only all past events, the whole history of civilizations and of cultures. It is even the present attempts to make a breach in the course of time, down to the event happening yesterday, all of which are apprehended as already past and projected into the merely possible. That famous perpetual present, which we keep hearing about ad nauseum, is only a house arrest in the present to come. The aesthetic hell in which we are evolving presents itself in this way. Everything that might inspire us is gathered there, visible in the distance, but resolutely out of contact. Everything we are lacking is held in reserve, in an inaccessible limbo. The aesthetic state, from Schiller to Leo 2004, names the state of suspension in which all of life seems to unfold, in all its luxuriant possibility, in all its imaginable plenitude, at a distance held at bay by savagely guarded no man's land. Nothing better materializes this aesthetic operation than the triumph of the installation in contemporary art. Here, it's the apparatus itself that becomes a work of art. We are absolutely included in it, just as so many avant-garde had dreamed, and yet, at the same time, absolutely rejected, excluded from any possible use within it. Through one and the same diabolical movement, we are integrated as strangers in this little portable hell. They don't call it relational aesthetics for no reason. Against all aesthetics, Warburg sought to show that, contained even in the image, in the most anthropomorphic representations of Western art, there were points of irreducibility, extreme tensions, energies which the work withholds and invokes at the same time. That there is life in motion, even in the immobility of Renaissance statues. And that these forces, these formulas of pathos, are able not only to touch us, but to affect us. Benjamin notes similarly, quote, the currently messianic elements appear in the work of art as content, the backward elements as its form. The content advances towards us, the form freezes in place, doesn't let us come near, end quote. We say that there are everywhere, integral with the real, with words, with bodies, with sounds, images, and gestures, similar points of irreducibility where forms of life, man and his world, perception and action, being and its determinations are not separated. Marx, for example, is the name of a certain irreducibility between communism and revolution. Everywhere words are mingled with effects, bodies with ideas, perceptions with gestures. 
The way man speaks is connected at a very detectable point with the grammar of his organs. The sense that certain words assume for him offers the best indications of his physiology. If you doubt this, you only need to see what the Hakas filmed by Jean Rouge do with the intensities that are captive in the colonial decorum. We call these points forms of life. We call them that because no one can separate in these points the individual from the species. Each form of life that affects and traverses a body is charged with a collective intensity, past, present, or future, saturated with the moment of the life of the species. Species, what a repugnant term. If the artisan can be a form of life, this is never, when you come down to it, without some faint evocation of the medieval town and the regime of the trade guilds. That collective intensity is present in the very perception I have of the artisan and in their way of being in the world. In a similar fashion, the autonomous warrior never looms forth without bringing with him the swarm of savage hordes. The child never plays Indians without something threatening in it. It's not that they are animated by the past, but that the same form of life assembles them into a constellation, halos them, passes through them. In the same way, every Christian captures a little of the shared intensity of so many Jewish sects of 2,000 years ago, beginning with the Essenes, and every young girl neutralizes in her way some Greek maenad. Undoubtedly, this is where there cannot be any question of history in the matter, because there are channels of subtle circulation that make the so-called past present, albeit by fragments, by floating concentrates. The messianic gesture consists in clearing a passage for these forms of life that emerge in the most rarefied language, in the most semiotized environment, in the dullest of gazes. It consists in freeing the chaos of forms of life from the grip of aesthetics. Paradoxically, the reign of aesthetics is first of all that of a general anesthesia. The imperial epic is thus a highly methodical prevention of the messianic. It's a time of citation, of reference, of existential prudence. In it, all the forms of life are held in respect. They are possibilities of art, of history, of the past. Subjectivities get absorbed in glosses on some bygone figure. They delight in lost worlds only to take fright when these threaten to return. One tries to live as in the time of Muhammad or as in the time of the Templars. There is an aesthetic quality in the Trotskyist relationship with the political, just as there is snobism in the relationship of the ultra-left of the 1920s. The array of metropolitan subjectivities gives, in the general, the full measure of what snobism is capable of. Instead of clearing a passage for forms of life, the snob endlessly reiterates the aesthetic operation of incarnating the form it has previously extracted from what was living, quote, which means that while speaking henceforth in a suitable way of everything that is given to him, post-historical man must continue to detach forms from their contents, doing this no longer to actively transform the latter, but in order to set himself against himself as a pure form for himself and others taking as whatever contents. End quote. This is how Kohev describes the hypothesis of a snobbish end of history in the Japanese manner, an aesthetic end of history. Quote, aesthetic consciousness, poor Vadimo confirms, doesn't make a choice. It confines itself to freeing the object, which it focuses on from everything that connects it to the real world, as a world of knowledge and decision, and transferring it into the sphere of pure appearance. End quote from Ethics of Interpretation. Aesthetics is the time of the infernal synthesis, the time of sociability, the reign of specters. Empire as religion for the senses. A fallacious etymology has the word religion derived from the Latin religar, to bind, insinuating that religion has as its vocation to connect humans to one another and to the divine, instead of from religare, gathering one's thoughts recollecting in the sense of reconsidering what one has done, reflecting or rethinking, redoubling one's attention and application. As happens in every ritual whose forms must be scrupulously repeated, every religion, by causing to exist a special sphere of the sacred, sets itself up as a guardian of its separation from the sensory world. This is to say that it produces the sensory world as sensory world. The fact that it becomes hostile to everything, without and within, that maintains itself in a non-separation between sensory and supersensory, mage, sorceress, mystic, messiah, or convulsionary, results logically from its definition. 
one better understands the malaise that took hold of the entire profane world with the death of God. But the place of the divine deserted, the profane world revealed itself as being not even profane. Even the pleasant immersion in imminence was lost. What was to be done? The aesthetic project responded historically to the situation, with German idealism in the forefront. Witness that strange fragment from Holderlin titled Communism of the Spirits. Strange, first of all, by its title, Communismus is spelled with a C, that is, a la Francaise, in a period, 1798, when the Babavists themselves scarcely dared to call themselves anything more than communatistes. Strange, too, is the name of its first paragraph, Disposition, where one reads, quote, We start from the exact opposite principle, from the generality of unbelief, in order to prove the necessity of institutions for our time. This unbelief is correlated with the scientific critique of our times, which accelerates ahead of its positive speculation. Lamentation is fruitless. The task is the remedy. End quote. The unbelief in question here is not essentially a lack of belief in this or that religion, or in God himself. The unbelief in question, as our contemporaries attest daily, those who can experience their own destruction as an aesthetic enjoyment of the first order, those who see a tsunami approaching and think they're in a movie. It's well and truly the inability to believe in what's right in front of us in the sensory world itself. This kind of haunted incredulity that can be read in so many eyes, in so many gestures, this state of irresolute absence, this crisis of presence, is precisely what the aesthetic project, empire and its apparatuses are tasked with remedying. Under empire, design and urbanism inscribe the unity of the world become problematic directly into things. They fashion the brand new sensory world. Mass media invents the common language of the day on a just-in-time basis. The various means of communication make available at any moment all those whom we have always already left, and whom we still call, absurdly, our family. And finally, culture and spectacles guarantee us the existence of that which we could experience and think, and which we now only glimpse. So it is that locally, cranium by cranium, household by household, city center by city center, the imperial metropolis does its work, reconstructing for itself an apparently stabilized, credible, and consensual universe, and a stasis, a shared perception of the world. Empire is a planetary factory of the sensible, and just as religion claimed to divinely reunite men when in reality it kept them separated, the sensory religion of empire, which claims to recompose the unity of the world from its base, from the local level, only establishes a new separation in every place and every being. The separation between the user and the apparatus, in this way, the aesthetic imposes itself on a global scale as the impossibility of all use. The prospectus of a recent exposition in Bordeaux announced, with a wink, the artists transform what you're sold to the supermarket into a work of art. One sees how aesthetics alone manages to fulfill the impossibility of use contained in every commodity, manages to convert it, behind a store window or at the heart of an installation, into pure exposition value. In the end, the aesthetic program aims to extend the scission even to man himself, to incorporate the apparatus into him, to make him a user of himself. It is easy to grasp the extent to which the biopolitical disposition to apprehend oneself as a body and the spectacular disposition to reflect oneself as an image, both conspire to transform us into users of ourselves, to make us aesthetic subjects. Communism and Magic The office manager all alone shouting into his cell phone, the sales representative attached to his briefcase, the driver cursing at the wheel of their car, the stylish party freak in his techno dance floor, the seller at the hip store with their company bullshit, our contemporaries act like they're under a spell. All the world's leftists may very well claim to be opening people's eyes about the extent of the catastrophe, but the matter was decided over 70 years ago. It doesn't serve any purpose to awaken the consciousness of a world already sick with consciousness, because this bewitchment isn't the product of a superstition or an illusion that will only have to be dispelled. It's a practical bewitchment. It's their subjugation to apparatuses. The fact that only when they're coupled to some apparatus do they experience themselves as subjects. Artoud speaks the truth when he writes in January 1947 that, quote, much better than through its army, its institutions, its police, it is through enchantments that society holds together, end quote. 
In every use, there resides a possible escape from bewitchment. For use liberates the forms of life contained in things, in words, in images. In use, a curious circulation is established between subject and object, between species. Gesture short circuits consciousness, temporarily abolishes the distance between ego and world, and calls to others. The gaze incorporates perceived movements and forms into our being. Something happens in us and outside of us. The coincidence of the changing of circumstances and of human activity or self-changing can be conceived and rationally understood only as revolutionary practice, say the thesis on Farabach. But it can be grasped and understood magically as use, at least, if magic is a constant communication from interior to exterior, from act to thought, from thing to word, from matter to spirit. That matter is animated by innumerable forms of life, that it is people with intimate polarizations, is something that Marx himself was not unaware of. Writing in The Holy Family, he says, quote, The first and most important of the inherent qualities of matter is motion, not only mechanical, mathematical movement, but still more impulse, vital life, spirit, tension, or to use Jacob Bohem's expression, the throes of matter. The primary forms of matter are the living, individualizing forces of being inherent in it, producing specific differences, end quote. These primary forms are what we have called forms of life. They affect us, whether we intended it or not, through all that links us together, through all that we are connected to. We have a hard time granting that we are interconnected, because we are possessed by an aesthetic idea of freedom, an idea of freedom as detachment, as indetermination, as extraction from any determination. Quote, this intermediary disposition where the soul is determined neither physically nor morally, and yet where it is active in these two manners, merits in particular the name of free disposition, and if one calls physical the state of sensory determination, and logical or moral the state of rational determination, one will give to the state of real and active determination the name aesthetic state. Doubtless man possesses this humanity virtually before each of the determined states through which he may pass, but he effectively loses it with each of the determined states through which he passes, and for him to come to a contrary state it must be rendered to him each time by the aesthetic state. End quote from Schiller's Letters. This idea of freedom is the freedom of the manager, who travels the globe from luxury hotel to luxury hotel, that of the scientist, sociologist, or physicist, no matter, who is never anywhere that he describes, that of the metropolitan anarchist, who wants to be able to do what he wants when he wants, that of the intellectual who makes sovereign judgments about everything from his office, or that of the contemporary artist, who makes his whole life a work of art, and for whom the single imperative is invent yourself, produce yourself, buy yourself, as the vile Boriard says. To this aesthetic idea of freedom, we counterpose the material evidence of forms of life. We see that human beings are not simply determined, in the sense that there will be on the one hand, being as such, pure of any determination, that would don the set of its attributes, of its predicates, and its accidents. French, male, son of a worker, plays football, has a headache, etc. What there is in reality is the manner in which each being inhabits their determinations. And in this regard, the determination and the being are absolutely indistinct, and they are form of life. We say that freedom doesn't consist in detaching ourselves from all our determinations, but in elaborating the manner in which we inhabit this or that determination that it doesn't reside in the liberation from all ties, but in learning the art of forming ties and undoing them, that this art has long been referred to as magic doesn't cause us any embarrassment, and we embrace its scandal, that of accepting the threat, in us, outside us, of the crisis of presence. We even say that if there is an effective equality among humans, it is an equality in the face of this threat, which is what makes Kafka a great communist. We prefer that, and by far, to the all-too-familiar paradox. The more someone takes themselves for an individual, the more one finds them reproducing the structures of the behavior most stupidly characteristic of the species. The more one takes oneself for a subject, the more we see them abandon themselves, through random access to the most sadly conformist pensions. We see quite clearly that for the moment, being in limbo, the forms of life remain in a formidable chaos. That it's this feeling of chaos, plus the attachment to the idiotic idea of freedom, that throws our contemporaries into the nets of apparatuses. 
but we also see all the potential at the disposal of those who've learned the art of forming ties and dissolving them. And we imagine what terrible force is in the hands of those who, collectively, are elaborating the play of the form of lives that are affecting them. We are not afraid to call communism the general sharing of that force, because this is how humans arrive at maturity, while their gestures carry in them the sovereignty of the child. Perhaps Stone Age man only drew the elk in such an incomparable way, because the hand that wielded the point still recalled the bow with which it brought the animal down. The manna is fleeing. Let's reinvent the magic.